right, guys, now we're going to be looking at chapter 26, which is the urinary system. Um, so when we look at these chapters that kind of went boom, 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 where we talked about 23, 24, 20, 23, 24, and 26, these are all going to be areas where waste gets removed in different ways. All right, so in the lungs, the respiratory system, we saw that we get rid of gas waste as carbon dioxide. In the digestive system, we saw that we got rid of solid waste from the food that we ate. And now in the urinary system, we're going to see where we're going to get rid of liquid waste. With the urinary system, you can see in the diagram over here, there's a number of structures. You have your kidneys, which is the functional structure that actually creates the urine. You then have the ureter, which is going to transport the urine to the bladder. The bladder is going to store the urine for a temporary time, and then the urethra is going to be the tube that releases the urine to the outside to get rid of it. Okay, so the only main structure that actually cleans and filters the blood or has a purpose besides transport and storage is the kidney itself. So let's look at the function of the urinary system. The main function is to have the removal of waste. This removal of waste from the body is the liquid portion um, that we're going to see removed. There's other areas that also remove waste, like the lungs, they will remove the gas waste. Your skin can also remove some liquid waste, that's with sweating. And your GI tract is also going to help rid waste in the solid form. So the kidneys are not gonna be the only thing that releases the waste, but they are the liquid portion. Now, because they are there to get rid of waste, they also are going to help maintain homeostasis. Now, there's a number of ways that they're going to do this. They're going to help control the compensation and volume of the blood, and so they're going to help um, know how much water needs to be left in the blood. They're also going to be checking for red blood cell amounts and things like that. So they're constantly going to be monitoring the composition and how much blood you have. They also are going to help regulate your blood pH. Remember, your blood pH needs to stay pretty constant. We don't want it to get too acidic or too basic, and the kidneys will help monitor this as well. They can get rid of different substances depending on if they need to make an adjustment. Um, they also will help regulate your blood pressure. This is going to go back to the whole idea of volume and composition of blood. Um, the more volume of blood you have, normally the more pressure there is, and so they're going to help monitor blood pressure. They also are going to help um, with some metabolic functions. Remember that kidneys do produce two hormones that we talked about in the hormone chapter. Um, one is they produce calcicitrol, which helps activate vitamin D when it goes and um, talks to the intestines and tells the intestines to, um, when it goes to the digestive system and tells the digestive system to um, activate the vitamin D so it can help absorb calcium. We also see that it is going to um, make erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is going to be a hormone that goes to the bone marrow and tells the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells because these guys are monitoring how many red blood cells come through um, each day. Okay, so that's going to be some of the roles that the urinary system also has besides the removal of waste. So when we take a quick look at these organs, this picture is found on page 980 in your book. You can see you have the kidneys. They're going to produce the urine. The ureters are the two tubes here that lead from the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder is going to be a muscular sac that's going to be used for storing your urine. And then the urethra is going to be the exit tube. It's going to be where urine exits the body. So these are the organs of the urinary system. Now we are going to um, really kind of focus more on the kidneys because they're the more functional part, but we will talk about each of these structures. So guys, nephrology is the study of the structure, function, and disease of the urinary system, um, but it also is going to be the study of the male reproductive system because they are closely tied together, unlike in the female system that we saw with reproduction. Urology is the study in, of the surgery of the urinary system as well as the male reproductive system. Now, the kidneys, guys, are not covered by the peritoneum. Remember we talked about the peritoneum is the covering that covers most of your abdominal organs. The kidneys are retroperitoneal, which means that they are behind this particular membrane. All right, so they're outside of the peritoneum, they're behind that structure. Now there are three layers to the kidney that are going to um, surround the kidney and help hold the kidney in place, all right? Because the kidneys otherwise would be floating um, around your body because they're not held by that peritoneum membrane. We want them to be held in place. And so one of these that we see is the renal capsule. The renal capsule is the innermost layer. It's made of fibrous protective layer of smooth, dense, irregular connective tissue. This continues into the coat of the ureter. So this is going to be a tissue that 
that covers the kidney itself and goes into the ureter as well, okay? It's that innermost tissue. We then see that you have adipose tissue, our capsule. This is the layer that's in the middle. It's the um, going to be there for protection against shock and trauma. So if you get like a kidney punch or something or you get hit in your back, this is to help protect that kidney because it is in that area. You have two kidneys, one on each side of your vertebral column. And so because of this, this fat capsule is going to help with cushioning and shock absorbing um, for the kidney. The outermost layer is called the renal fascia. This is the outer layer made of dense irregular connective tissue. This is actually going to be the layer that attaches the kidney to the abdominal wall. It's going to help hold it in place. All right, hold it up against that abdominal wall since again it is not covered by the peritoneum. One thing to note too, guys, if you take a look at the kidney, the kidney is bean-shaped. Um, it's a bean-shaped organ, and it's going to have some very specific structures that help it with its function of filtering out um, the liquid waste. So let's take a look at the anatomy of the kidney itself. We have what we call the hilus or the hilum. This is an indentation on the medial side of each kidney. So towards the middle side of each kidney, there's gonna be an indent that you can see here. Um, this is where your blood vessels and nerves are going to enter as well as the ureter is going to leave. All right, so blood vessels, the artery, the renal artery and the renal vein are gonna come in here as well as the main nerve to your kidney. And then the ureter is gonna be attached here that's going to connect the kidney to the bladder. This is called the hilus or the hilum. You can see it here. So then we have the renal cortex. The renal cortex is the outer portion of the kidney. It is next to the renal capsule. So the renal capsule was the outer portion of those tissues we just talked about that hold it in place. The renal cortex is the outer portion and you, again, you can see it here on this diagram. We then have the renal medulla. The medulla is a deeper layer of each kidney. This medulla is going to have a number of structures and you can see some of them here. We have the renal pyramids. This is a cone-shaped structure inside the renal medulla. Um, a kidney can have from eight to 18. I don't know why there is that big discrepancy. Um, it could be based on the size, genetics, things like that, but there's normally gonna be eight between eight and 18 of these pyramids in each kidney. We also see that there's what we call the renal papilla. This is the apex of each pyramid, so it's gonna be where it comes to the apex. Um, this is gonna be close to the renal pelvis. You'll also notice in this picture there's the renal pyramid. We will talk about that on the next slide. You will also see in this diagram that there's the renal column. We will talk about this on the next slide. So the renal columns is where the cortex extends between the medulla. All right, so it's gonna be where the cortex comes in between there. We also see that you have the renal, we also see that you have the renal calces. This is a cup-shaped structure. This is deep um, to the renal papillae, the, the um, structure that's the point. Um, this is gonna be where the route of the urine goes towards the renal pelvis and it's gonna be collected in this area. This is gonna then lead to the renal pelvis, which is the central cavity of each kidney, which connects to the ureter, which is the tube that connects the renal pelvis to the urinary bladder. So since we're cleaning out blood in the kidney, it's really important to look at the blood supply to that kidney. So the main artery that brings blood to the kidney is called the renal artery. This is gonna branch into many thousands of what we call afferent arterioles. These afferent arterioles are going to loop themselves into small little knots. These knots are going to be called glomular tufts. Now this is super important because this is the area that's gonna come in contact with the nephron, which is the functional part of the kidney and we're going to clean the blood at this point. Now leaving each of the glomular tuff is the efferent arterial. If you can think of the efferent with the E, it's going to be exiting. It's going to be where the blood has now been cleaned and it's going to exit out of the kidney. Each efferent arterial will branch into what we call paratubular capillaries, also known as the vasa recta, and the paratubular capillaries will merge to form the renal vein which will carry the blood away from the kidney. Now, this blood that's being carried away from the kidney is going to be cleaned. It's going to have been filtered and it's going to have the waste removed at this point. Now guys, each kidney sees about 200 milliliters of blood per minute and it's going to continually clean out this blood um, 24-7. Um, the picture of the kidney here is found on page, five, uh, found on page 985. 
So let's now talk about the structural component of the kidney that does the actual filtering and cleaning. Um, this is called the nephron. It's the functional unit of the kidney. Um, it's located in the cortex of the kidney. Okay, and you can actually see here in this picture, there's a dotted line that tells you the top part's in the cortex, the bottom part over here is in the medulla. You'll notice that there's what we call the renal uh, corpuscle. This has the glomular, glomulus. This is the tuft of the capillary loops, that kind of knot that the capillary made. The blood pressure here is slightly increased so that we can actually push stuff out, the waste out at this point. This area is also known as the Bowman's capsule. It's a double-walled epithelial cup which surrounds this glomulus. The inner wall of this cup is made of what we call podocytes, and they create filtration slits. So as the fluid's being pushed out due to the high pressure inside of the um, artery, this cup area is going to start collecting that fluid, and it's going to bring it into that nephron. Okay, so that's what the renal um, corpuscle is going to do. Now one thing to note though that most of what's being pulled out of here guys are going to be, it's going to be fluid, it's going to be um, some proteins, it's going to be um, some of your smaller ions, things like that. Red blood cells and stuff like that aren't allowed to leave here unless there's a damage to the structure. And you can see it located here. So then we see the renal tubule. This is the proximal convoluted tubule, um, abbreviated as the PCT. This is made of simple cuboidal epithelial cells um, with microvilli. These are called a brush border, and they're going to constantly go through, and they're going to be brushing through, like combing through what's come in to the structure, seeing what is waste and what's not. Because sometimes, guys, some things that we need gets put into this urine, and we want to get it back to the blood. All right, so these are going to brush through there looking at what came through, what is waste, and what do we need to keep. And this is going to be on the proximal convoluted tubule you see here. The next one we have is the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle is the nephron loop that comes down. It has a descending limb that comes down this way. It's made of simple squamous epithelial cells. This is going to be important because it is thin, which means that water is going to be able to pass freely through this side of the loop of Henle of the loop of Henle. On the other side, the ascending limb going up, you'll notice it's thicker. This is made of simple cuboidal or columnar epithelial cells. This is not going to allow water to move as freely. All right, and there's going to be a reason for this when we start talking a little bit more about um, how we want to hold on to water back into our blood. Okay, so the loop of Henle is shown here, and you can see that we have the descending and then we have the ascending loop. We then on this other side have what we call the distal convoluted tubule. This is abbreviated as the DCT. This is made of simple cuboidal epithelial cells, and this is kind of the last chance to filter anything in and out. Um, this is the area that most of our hormones that deal with um, holding onto water for blood pressure and stuff like antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, this is the area it's going to talk to because this is the last chance to be able to hold on to anything that we want to keep. Once it leaves this distal convoluted tubule, we're going to see that it's going to enter into the collecting duct, and the collecting duct is then going to send it through the ureter, and it's going to go into the bladder, so then it's lost. So we want to make sure that this is the last place that if we need to hold on to anything specifically, this area is going to do that. So guys, if you take a look here in your textbook, you have two kind of looks at what a nephron can look like. Um, you have on the on the uh, left side of your screen, um, on page 987, you find this nephron. This nephron is actually a shorter nephron, and about 80 to 85 percent of your nephrons look like this in your kidneys. Um, if you'll look, most of the nephron is located in the cortex, only a short portion is located in the medulla, and that's going to be that loop of Henle. Um, you'll see how the blood vessels are constantly wrapping around these tubes, and that's because there's a constant movement of fluid and ions back and forth as we're filtering out the blood, okay, so we can see here so that we hopefully get the cleanest product possible by the end. On the other side, though, of the screen, on page 988, you have this picture. This is your junk stone medullary nephrons. If you'll notice, they're a little longer, okay? So their loop of Henle is a lot longer, and it goes deeper into the medulla. About 15 to 20% of your nephrons are this particular structure. Um, 
So they have a thin and thick portion to their ascending limb, which is gonna be important in water absorption. And so these guys are gonna be really important in helping with that regulating of blood pressure and holding onto water, especially if you're dehydrated, All right? So there's just kind of the two structures and they are very similar. However, there are a few differences on their length that we see here. So let's talk about the, ju the juxtoglomular apparatus. Um, this apparatus is um, abbreviated as the JGA. Um, we see that there's an area that's called the macula densa. This is where the renal tubular cells at the top end of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle are very densely packed together. Okay, that's what the macula densa means. Um, they are constantly measuring your sodium and chlorine that's um, forming in the urine. So they're constantly measuring your salt content. Here, the columnar cells, the longer columnar cells um, of this loop of Henle are going to be taller and they're more crowded together. That's where the densa comes in. They're densely packed together. This macula densa comes into close contact with the afferent arterial where the incoming blood. So we have the juncture glomular cells. These are modified smooth muscle cells in the wall of the afferent arterial. These muscle cells are gonna come in close contact with the macula densa. These muscle cells um, are going to be constantly being stretched or um, relax depending on blood pressure. The higher the blood pressure, the more stretched, the lower the blood pressure, blood pressure the less stretched. So this apparatus of the stretching is gonna help regulate blood pressure and it's also gonna regulate the glomular filtration rate. Okay, how much urine is going to be made. If blood pressure is too low, we're going to see that this filtration rate is gonna decrease, which is going to trigger that renin-angiotensin pathway, which we talked about in the hormone chapter, where it's gonna cause the adrenal glands to release aldosterone, which is gonna help them hold the kidneys hold on to water and raise the blood pressure. So guys, in this particular picture of the nephron, it's an overview and it's showing you what's kind of happening here. So over here you have number one where the renal capsule is going to take place. We are gonna produce the filtrate. This is where we're pushing the fluid out and it's being collected into the proximal convoluted tube. In this proximal convoluted tube, you're gonna see reabsorption of water back into the blood. You're also gonna see ions and other organic nutrients moving back into the blood at the proximal convoluted tubule. Then you're going to see that it's going to go through the, the loop of Henle. As it goes through this nephron loop, you're going to see further absorption of water in the descending limb, the limb coming down because it's thinner, and you're going to see both sodium and chloride ions being absorbed in the ascending limb. We're going to put those back into the blood. Now this is really important because, especially with the sodium, water likes to go with the sodium. However, this thicker region of the ascending limb does not let water come through. It does let the sodium, but not the water. Then you see the distal convoluted tube up here where we're going to see secretion of ions and acids as well as drugs and toxins that we don't need and we want to get rid of. We also see that there'll be different reabsorption of water and sodium as well as calcium depending on what hormones come and talk to this area. Remember, this is the last shot, the last chance to hold on to anything. So this is where hormones like um, antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone will talk to the kidney. So urine guys is formed in three main processes that we need to talk about. So the first process that we see happening, and all these processes are happening simultaneously through different parts of the nephron, the first step is the glomular filtrate. This is where the plasma is gonna get forced out of the blood into that Bowman's capsule, okay? The blood pressure forces water as well as any dissolved solutes through that endothelial tissue or pores of the Bowman's capsule. This fluid is now called filtrate because it's no longer in the blood vessel, so it's not called plasma, it's called filtrate. Now, blood cells in most proteins cannot be filtered out here because they are too large. So they are gonna remain in the blood. Now again, this is true as long as there's not any damage to these nephrons or the kidney. If there's damage and blood does come out and blood is found in the urine, that could tell you that there's an infection or trauma that's happened here. This glomular filtration rate, which we see as GFR, is the amount of filtrate formed by in both kidneys per minute, okay? So in a healthy adult, you actually have a filtration rate of 125 milliliters per minute. You are constantly producing urine. Now, 
low blood pressure in the glomular tuft is going to decrease the glomular filtrate. This is going to make it where you don't make as much urine, and this normally will happen if you're dehydrated. This is called a anuria, which means that they're not producing as much urine. In some renal diseases, the glomular capillaries can become damaged. This allows plasma proteins to enter the filtrate. Um, the less proteins in the blood, the less osmotic pressure to keep the water in the blood. This can actually increase the filtrate rate, even though we don't want to, and this is called polyuria, where you're producing too much urine. Now, while this filtration is happening, this rate is going to be regulated in three ways. The first is what we call the renal autoregulation. This involves those J JGA, or that apparatus we just talked about, that's going to be monitoring the blood pressure with its stretch. When the blood pressure is low, these cells are going to release less vasoconstrictor, okay, so they're not going to constrict as much. They're going to dilate, which is going to raise the filtrate level. On the other hand, when the blood pressure is high, these cells are going to constrict and lower the filtrate rate. Okay, so we're going to see that it's going to be um, auto-regulated here by this apparatus. There's also neural regulation of the filtration rate. This is regulated by your autonomic nervous system. When we see with the autonomic nervous system at rest, when your parasympathetic neurons are in control, you see vasodilation, so the filtrate rate is going to increase and be high because you're at rest, there's not a problem, you can create urine. But if you're stressed, you'll notice the sympathetic neurons are going to cause vasoconstriction, which will decrease the filtrate rate, okay? And it causes you to not make as much urine. There's also a hormone regulation of this rate. Um, angiotensin II can increase the blood pressure, but in doing so, it's going to decrease the filtration rate. We see the atrial natriuretic uh, peptide that's going to be released by the heart. This is going to cause diuresis and also um, naturesis, which is going to decrease your blood pressure and increase your filtration rate. So there's different hormones which will either increase the amount of urine or decrease the amount of urine. And urine. However, they're both related to the blood pressure. All right, so now the next thing we want to look at is a, a flow chart on this autoregulation. So very similar to some of the flow charts we've seen in past presentations. We're going to start here. Um, you can see that homeostasis was disrupted. We have a decreased filtration rate resulting in decreased filtrate in urine production. So what's going to happen? We're going to see dilation of the afferent arterioles, constriction of um, the mesangeal cells, constriction of the afferent, efferent arterioles. This is going to increase the glomular blood pressure. If we can increase the glomular blood pressure, that's going to increase the filtration rate and return it back to homeostasis, okay, if it's sufficient enough, all right? So this is showing you that kind of auto-regulation that can take place. We also see that sometimes we need that extra help from the endocrine system. This is going to be where that renin angiotensin pathway comes into play. So over here we see that homeostasis is going to be disrupted. The endocrine response is going to take place because those, juxto, those juxtalomular cells um, are being um, are not being stretched enough, so they're going to release renin. Renin's going to enter the pathway, which is going to trigger um, the conversion of um, angiotensin into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then going to be converted in the lungs to angiotensin 2 by the enzyme ACE. Angiotensin 2 then is going to go and talk to the adrenal glands and that's going to trigger the release of aldosterone. We also see that all of these things are going to hopefully increase and stimulate different areas of your body like your thirst centers. They're going to cause vasodilation they're going to cause vasoconstriction of the blood vessels to raise your blood pressure. Um, they are going to increase your cardiac output. Um, and the whole point of this is to increase the blood pressure. This will also, though, cause increased glomular pressure eventually, so your glomular the glomular filtration rate will eventually get back to normal. However, during this time period, we see though that urine will be decreased because we're going to be holding on to the extra water until we can restore homeostasis of that blood pressure. Now, if you'll notice, the whole point of showing you this flow chart is that this is actually a very complex process. And again, you are unaware of this happening in your body at, at any given time. 
while filtration is being made on one side, okay, coming out of that Bowman's capsule, we also see that within these tubes, the proximal convoluted tube, the loop of Henle, and also the distal convoluted tube, there's gonna be movement of stuff going back and forth. Okay, this is gonna be your tubular reabsorption though, where we're gonna reabsorb stuff back to the blood. This is the movement of certain filtrate substances back to the blood. This allows the blood to keep important substances like water, if we need water, glucose for sugar, amino acids is AA, um, sodium, potassium, calcium, chlorine, um, it could go, the list can go on and on. Hydrocarbons, um, we also see phosphates, whatever the body may need to keep, we can take it back and reabsorb it in these tubes. Now, one that's really important is the sodium. If sodium ions are gonna be actively reabsorbed by that sodium potassium pump, this is gonna take place in all of the tubes. It's gonna take place in the proximal convoluted tube, the distal convoluted tube, and the collecting duct. Now, the whole point of reabsorbing the um, sodium actively, it's gonna provoke promote osmotic reabsorption of water in a passive way. Water loves sodium. So if sodium goes in a certain direction, water is gonna want to follow it. So since we actively pump the sodium back to the blood, water is going to follow and also go back to the blood in this process. Other substances like um, potassium, chlorine, um, the hydrocarbon, all that's gonna go in, and urea, these can also be passively reabsorbed down their gradient. They're still gonna move from high to low. However, urea is the actual waste product. We don't want that to go back into the blood, so even though some of it gets reabsorbed through these tubes, we wanna also get it back in to the tubes. This is gonna bring us to the third step. Now, one thing to note about this, this filtrate that's made, about 99% of it actually gets reabsorbed back into the blood, which is kind of a weird thing. And the reason for this is normally all the glucose and amino acids need to get actively reabsorbed. We don't want to lose them in the urine, all right? And so the proximal convoluted tube is going to pull these guys back in. There is, however, a renal threshold. There's a maximum amount that the blood can hold of glucose and amino acids. Once it reaches that threshold, Hold, the kidneys cannot put any more back. So if the blood level is above this renal threshold, the tubular reabsorption cannot keep pace. So some of this glucose and some of these amino acids could spill into the urine. Okay, they'll remain in the urine or the filtrate. This can be called a uh, glycosuria. Okay, if it's got high uh, glucose levels, this can be seen a lot of times in diabetics, or we can see it could be amino acidurea, which means that they have amino acids in their um, filtrate. Okay, these can give us um, indications of maybe some potential problems when we do a urine analysis. So this is one reason why when you go to the doctor, the first thing they do is do a urine analysis because it's less invasive than a blood test. In the loop of Henle, you're gonna see more ions in water get reabsorbed. The descending limb is permeable to water, so water and some ions will get reabsorbed. The ascending limb, though, is not permeable to water. It's only going to allow ions to be reabsorbed. The reabsorption continues in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Um, water is gonna be reabsorbed under the control of antidiuretic hormone at this point, and sodium can be reabsorbed under the control of aldosterone. Now remember, if sodium is gonna be reabsorbed water will follow now aldosterone though because we're keeping the sodium it is going to cause potassium to be excreted um, in exchange for that sodium now We've put stuff back to the blood. Now we have to have what we call tubular secretion. This is, this is movement of materials from the blood back into the filtrate. So at some point after the glomular tuft, we wanna make sure all the waste gets put back into the urine because we want this blood to be as clean as possible. This helps the body get rid of certain substances like potassium, also NH3, which is a toxic waste product of protein catabolism of breaking down proteins. We also see urea, which is the waste product from protein catabolism, which got filtered and partially reabsorbed. We wanna put it back into the urine. Creatine, most creatine is filtered and not reabsorbed. Small amounts um, 
are normally going to be secreted. Um, creatine, sometimes you may have heard of creatine when bodybuilders will take this to help build proteins. Um, certain drugs like penicillin, um, certain things that we take, the excess will be excreted at this point as well in tubular secretion. Now, the next thing that tubular secretion does is it also have, helps regulate your blood pH. If the blood is becoming too acidic, it's going to secrete the um, hydrogen ions during what we call acidosis. The urine then will become more acidic and the blood will become less acidic. So the hydrogens can be exchanged for sodium in this reabsorption stage. Now some collecting duct cells, they can actively transport hydrogen ions into the filtrate. So if the blood is still too acidic at the collecting duct side, the collect collecting duct can actually get more of those hydrogens out and put it into the urine. We also see that hydrocarbonate can be reabsorbed or produced by the renal tubules. This is going to actually buffer the blood. This is going to be a basic solution so it can help buffer the blood if it becomes too acidic. If it becomes too basic, we will want to actually stop the production of this and get rid of this as well in the urine. So if you take a look here, this is kind of a diagram that shows you what's taking place. In this first step over here, you have the blood vessel coming in contact with the glomular capsule. This is where filtrate is formed. So this is filtration. Then we see that stuff is going to move out of the tubes back to the blood. This is called tubular reabsorption. And then we see the last step where stuff's going to move back into the urine, and that's called tubular secretion. Now remember that all these processes are happening at the same time through every nephron in both your kidneys. So there's constantly a back and forth that's taking place to clean that blood to the best of their ability. So the excretion of a solute equals the glomular filtrate plus the secretion minus the reabsorption because the reabsorption means that's what went back to the blood and was not found in the urine. Now there is a good review for filtrate formation found in your textbook on page 991. Now again, here's another summary that shows you what's happening at each tube or each area. It tells you how the filtrate's formed and what's in it. It also tells you what gets reabsorbed and secreted in each of these sections. So again, this particular um, slide is just to kind of show you um, an overview of what's taking place in each section until finally after the collecting duct, we see the formation of urine. So there's a constant back and forth movement of different substances like sodium, hydrogen, hydrogens, glucose, amino acids, and so on, until finally, hopefully, the blood is as clean as possible. This particular picture is found in your textbook on page 1007. When urine is formed, it's important to look to see if urine is normal. That is one reason why one of the first tests that are done a lot of times when you go in and you're sick is a urine analysis. They take this urine and they analyze it physically, looking at the physical characteristics. They also will look at the chemical characteristics and they'll also look at it under the microscope for its microscopic properties. Now, urine guys is normally about 95% water, but that other 5% can give us a lot of indication of what's going on in the body. So in your textbook, there's a table on page 1008 which shows you what normally we should see with urine. For volume, you should, you should see one to two liters in a, in a 24 hour period, so through a day. This does con, uh, vary considerably depending on how much uh, fluid you drink. The color, it could be yellow or amber. Again, it's gonna vary based on the concentration. The more water you take in, the lighter the color of your urine. The darker the urine, the less water you've had, and it can be an indication of dehydration. You also can see that there could be different colors in the urine as well, depending on what kind of medications you might be taking or what you may have eaten, okay, at certain times. Turbidity is how transparent it is, not in the sense of it being clear as in white, but can you see through it, okay? If the, the urine is see-through, then that means there's not a lot of stuff in it. However, if it's cloudy, that means there could be white blood cells in there, which could indicate a potential bladder infection or kidney infection. There also will be a certain odor. A lot of times the urine will have a more mild odor, but if you've eaten certain things, you may have a more distinctive odor. Um, one of the foods, especially 
as asparagus, it smells the same way from when you ate it to when you urinate out the pro, uh, the byproducts, okay? It smells the same a lot of times. Um, urine in diabetics may have a more fruity smell due to the, the presence of ketones, which are extra glucoses and sugars in the urine. Um, the pH will also be looked at. pH can range between 4.6 and 8. Again, it depends on what's going on in the body. The more acidic it is, that means the more acid they needed to get rid of. The more basic is the more alkaline it is because the blood may have become alkaline based on maybe something you ate. Specific gravity is the density. What is dissolved in there? The more stuff that's dissolved in the urine, um, besides just water, the higher the density it's going to be. Again, this could be an indication of certain problems if it's high in salt, high in sugar, high in um, proteins, things like that. So guys, urine output is determined mainly by the hormone antidiuretic hormone. When osmotic, uh, when your body osmotic pressure gets low, you have very little antidiuretic hormone that's secreted. This means your kidneys will produce dilute or what we call hyper, hypotonic urine. So this urine a lot of times will be more clear in color and you produce a lot more of it. Okay, um, it looks more like water. On the other hand, when your body osmotic pressure is high, meaning you don't have a lot of water going through your blood vessels, you're going to produce more ADH. This is going to concentrate your urine, which we call hypertonic urine. This is going to have large amounts of water that gets reabsorbed, so the urine is going to be, um, there's going to be less urine produced, and it's also going to be darker in color, okay, because it's going to be more concentrated. Now, something that's unique that happens um, in the kidneys is what we call a countercurrent mechanism, and this is going to happen in the loop of um, Henle. So the loop has an, a descending loop with an ascending loop, and this is going to be similar to a positive feedback loop. The descending limb or loop is permeable to water. Water can come in and out of that very easily, okay? Um, however, the other tube, the ascending limb, is impermeable to water, but it does push out salt. Okay, and so this these come in contact here. So if more salt comes into the area from the ascending limb, the descending limb, more water is going to be pulled out. It's going to be attracted to that salt. Okay, so the filtrate at the bottom of the loop actually becomes the most concentrated, so the sodium pumps can work faster. This pulls more water out of the descending loop, which then allows the ascending loop to pull out more sodium, which then causes the descending loop to pour out, pull out more water, and it continues this way as a counter current. Overall effect is to concentrate the urine, holding on to as much water as possible just in case we need it. If we don't need this water that we reabsorb, it can be let go in the distal convoluted tube. But we want to be able to hold on to as much water as possible until we know for sure if we need it or not, whether those hormones are talking to that area and the distal convoluted tube. Now, there are some drugs that are called diuretics. Diuretics are drugs which increase urinary output. Um, there's many different um, mechanisms of action that these diuretics could use. Um, when we look at um, Elasix, this is going to be selectively inhibiting the sodium pumps. Um, since they can't, the sodium pumps can't do their job, then the sodium stays in the filtrate, which means the water stays in the filtrate, and so you increase the amount of urine. Other drugs may inhibit some of the sodium pumps on the distal convoluted tube. So even though your antidiuretic hormone or your aldosterone is talking to this part of the tube, these drugs are blocking that and making it hold on to the sodium so the water stays in that tube. Now a side effect of the diuretics could mean that you have um, an increased loss of potassium because if those sodium and potassium pumps are not working properly, we could have a increased loss of this potassium. Um, there are new drugs that they are developing of these diuretics that help spare the potassium. Um, the point here is they want to maybe inhibit the aldosterone where less sodium is reabsorbed, which then causes less potassium to be lost. Um, but again, um, it's a newer kind of look at how to use a diuretic in the sense of producing that extra urine. And guys, diuretics a lot of times are used on individuals who retain fluid. They're retaining fluid in their um, lower extremities or things like that, and so the kidneys are going to help get that extra fluid off their body. 
All right, so that's how kidneys work and how they make urine. Now, how do we get the urine out of the body? Well, we first then need to get it transferred to the bladder. It's gonna get to the bladder through the ureter. The ureter is made of three layers. The innermost layer is called the mucosa. It's made of transitional epithelium plus the lamella uh, propia. This is areolar connective tissue. This tube is very stretchy. Depending on how much fluid comes through, it's going to stretch and transition in its shape to allow that fluid to move to the bladder. The mucosa is also going to secrete mucus. This is to protect those cells of the tube because sometimes urine can be very acidic and we want to be able to protect those cells from the acid. The next layer, which is the middle layer, is the muscularis layer. This has some longitudinal muscles that are running this way, as well as circular smooth muscles. These are going to function back and forth with contracting with peristalsis, like we saw with the digestive system, to help move the urine towards the bladder. The last layer is the outermost layer, and it's called the adventia. Um, the adventia is made of areolar connective tissue plus blood vessels. There's also going to be some lymphatic vessels and nerves here. Um, these vessels and nerves are going to nourish the two other layers of the urethra. Um, this area is also going to help the hold the urethra in place because it is a long tube that we don't want it to get kinked going from the kidney to the bladder, so it's going to help hold it in place. Now, this brings me to a particular issue um, that starts in the kidneys, which are kidney stones. These are called uh, renal um, calculi or kidney stones. They form in the kidneys, however, they do need to hopefully leave the kidneys. They will leave through the ureters. They travel down the ureters to the bladder and then eventually out the urethra. The problem with this is that these stones are not smooth. They're not smooth stones like you find on the bottom of a riverbed. They look like little stickers or what we would call it goat heads okay and so they're very painful as they move through that tissue they rip through that tissue if the kidney stone is too large to fit through this tube it could cause a backup of urine which can cause major infections within the kidney and even cause kidney failure and so a lot of times if those stones are too large they are going to need to break them apart one way they can break these kidney stones into smaller pieces is what we call lithotripsy this is the breaking up of stones using sound waves right they break them into smaller pieces and then each piece has to pass through the, with the urine. Um, there's also another way which is more invasive where they go in with a laser and they kind of blow the stone up with a laser and then that gets passed. Okay. Um, my husband's had a lot of kidney stones and um, he calls the one with the laser the Star Wars um, treatment because it's like blowing up the Death Star with lasers. Um, he calls the one with the sound waves the Mortal Kombat. Uh, method because it's using sound waves like one of the characters off the Mortal Kombat video game that uses sound waves to knock over the enemy so this is just one way and you then have to pass each of the pieces of the stone all right, or your body's gonna have to reabsorb them. There's a number of reasons why kidney stones can be made. It could be a genetic thing. It can be based on what you eat. It's how you may process certain things like caffeine or carbon. Um, it just depends a lot of times on your genetics, age. There's a lot of risk, different risk factors for kidney stones. Now, the ureters are going to connect to the bladder. So the urinary bladder has an area that's called the trigon. The trigon is made, um, has tiny smooth, it's a, tiny smooth triangular area in the floor of the urinary bladder and it's got called the trigon because it forms like a triangle okay in the two corners of this triangle you're going to see the two ureters coming from each kidney okay and then at the base you're going to have the urethra which is going to leave and let the urine out through the body so it's saying that the the bladder has three tubes coming to it two ureters and the urethra leaving Again, the bladder is going to have three layers of tissue. It has the mucosa, which is the inner layer. This is transitional epithelial tissue. The reason it has this transitional tissue and the special structure of the rugae, like we saw in the stomach, is to allow it for be to allow it to distend. Okay, it's to distend in order to be able to hold the urine so that you're not having to go to the bathroom as often. Right, it's where we can store it. Muscularis is the middle layer. This is also called the distensor muscle. This this has got smooth muscle fibers in three layers. They're longitudinal, they're circular, and um, longitudinal again. Okay, so you have longitudinal, then circular around them, and then longitudinal on the outer part. 
Some of these circular smooth muscle fibers surround the urethral opening. These are going to be called a sphincter. You have an internal urethral sphincter. This is smooth muscle that is involuntary. You do not have active control of this internal sphincter. The external urethral sphincter, however, you do have control of because it's made of skeletal muscle. It's voluntary. This is what you have to be able to clench kind of and hold if you have to go to the bathroom really bad. This is why when kids go through that transition of diapers to underwear, it's called potty training. They have to train the sphincter. They need to be trained to know what it feels like when the internal sphincter tells you it need, you need to go to the bathroom. And you also have to train the external sphincter in order to either hold the urine in until you get to a bathroom or also to get it to relax to let the urine out all right so that's why potty training is such a long kind of almost hard process because it's it's training them how to feel those different things and utilize those muscles the underside of it and back of it is going to be covered by the adventia which is similar to the ureters areolar connective tissue helping hold the bladder in place however the top dome part of the bladder is covered by the serosa or the part of the peritoneum okay so the top part of the bladder is covered by the peritoneum the um, other part is covered by the adventia that we see with the ureters now, with the bladder, we see a reflex. It's called the microtrition reflex. This is going to be the reflex of going to the bathroom. So there's stretch receptors in your bladder wall that detect that the bladder is full. This could be between 200 and 400 milliliters of urine. It depends on the person. Some people's bladders are smaller, cannot hold as much urine, and others are, um, they would say, oh, I have an ironclad bladder. They can hold it forever. Um, it depends on um, how much that the bladder can hold. Now, these receptors send a nerve impulse to two places. The first place is to the spinal cord in the sacral region and this is why it's called a reflex because it doesn't have to go all the way to the brain at first, okay? Um, this is why it's called a reflex center. The impulse though will continue through the sensory tract from the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex so that you are aware that you need to go to the bathroom. When the impulse reaches the cerebral cortex, the person is aware of the bladder being full. They have a conscious, a conscious urge to empty their bladder tells you you need to go to the bathroom. The parasympathetic nervous system fibers um, from the microtrition reflex center will then send motor impulses to the distensor muscles, that middle layer of the bladder wall. It'll tell them to contract and it will tell the internal urethra sphincter to relax. This will then allow the urine to leave the body as long as you have also relaxed the external sphincter. All right, so this is why a lot of times you might get that feeling of I gotta go to the bathroom, but you can maybe hold it for a little while until you get there. This happens a lot of times on trips when the next town's not uh, is too is is not right there. It's a further away, and you may have to hold it. Um, sometimes you may hold it too long to where eventually you no longer have enough strength to hold that outer sphincter close and the reflex happens and we see the urine is released. Okay, so this is what we call the microtrition reflex. This is why you don't have to train babies how to go to the bathroom. It's a reflex, it automatically happens. Now, when we see that the parasympathetic system talks to these muscles, it contracts the distensor muscles and relaxes the external or the internal sphincter. The external urethra sphincter will still be closed or contracted. Your cerebral cortex will send an inhibitory motor response to the skeletal muscles to relax it. It is voluntary control though. Once these voluntary muscles um, are relaxed, we initiate urination. The actual emptying of the bladder is the reflex. Um, we can actually stop and start this process of urine flow voluntarily um, because of that external sphincter that's there. It is skeletal muscle, so you do have control over it, so you can stop and start the flow of urination. Now this brings us to some terms we call incontinence. This is the loss of that voluntary control of, of microtrition. This is where um, individuals as they grow older, they are incontinent. They do not have the ability to control this anymore. Babies are also considered incontinent, but they haven't been trained yet. After potty training, they are no longer considered this until they grow older and cannot hold it anymore. Retention is the ability to completely empty um, 
Retention is the inability to completely empty the bladder. You have to go to the bathroom and you start the emptying process, but it does not completely empty. So then after you go to the bathroom, you get to doing something else again and you have the urge to go to the bathroom again because you did not empty the bladder. This is abnormal. We should empty the bladder all at once. Um, uh, so that then it starts to refill. Um, but sometimes during certain kind of diseases or certain kinds of phases of life, there may be some retention that takes place. Now this brings us to our last structure, which is the urethra. When we look at the urethra, it is different in males and females, mostly based on the length. In females, the urethra is just behind the pubis symphysis is where the, the hip bones come together in the front. It is about one and a half inches long. It is angled inferiorly and anteriorly, so down and forward to the front. Um, it has three coats of tissue to it. It has the inner mucosa, which is the mucous membrane made of epithelium and that um, lamina propet. Uh, uh, propria. This is transitional epithelial near the bladder. It then transitions to stratified, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and finally to non characterized stratified squamous epithelium near the, or the external orifice. Um, the middle area is still muscularis, smooth circular muscle fibers, and it's held in place by the outer adventia. The male urethra is a lot longer. It's approximately six to eight inches long. Um, from the bladder, we have a couple of areas of the urethra. The first one's called the prostatic urethra. This is gonna move through the prostate. It's made of transitional epithelium. Then you're gonna have the membraneous urethra. This is gonna move through the urogenital diaphragm. It's gonna be stratified or pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Then you have the spongy urethra. This is the urethra that moves through the penis. It's going to become non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium near the orifice or the opening of the penis. There are two coats that we see here. There's the inner mucosa, which is a mucous membrane made of epithelium, okay, and that lamella propria. We also see that there's an outer muscularis region. It has circular smooth muscle fibers. These are going to help form the internal sphincter. At the membraneous urethra, you have the circular skeletal muscle fibers of the urogenital diaphragm. These fibers are going to help with the external urethra sphincter. Since they're structurally different, we see that they are a little bit functionally different as well on where these are gonna be located. So in your textbook, you can see the difference between the male and female. Okay, you have the picture of the male, which shows you that the re urethra is a lot longer, okay, um, than the female. Um, you also can see that it is divided into multiple areas because it passes through more structures. All right, so this particular picture just shows you the comparison, and it is found on page 1012 in your textbook. Now, at the very end of your um, chapter here, there are the disorders in homeostasis of the urinary system. Please read these pages. They're 1016 through 1019. They range from kidney stones all the way down to kidney transplants, renal failure. So take a look and please read over these particular diseases at the end of the chapter. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to contact me.